This is Your Morning Basket, where we help you bring truth, goodness, and beauty to your homeschool day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 21 of the Your Morning Basket podcast. I'm Pam Barnhill, your host, and I am so happy that you are joining me here today. Well, to say that Ken Ludwig's excitement for Shakespeare is infectious is a bit of an understatement. It's kind of hard to talk to Ken about Shakespeare and not get a little bit excited yourself, which is certainly what I did today. It was a really fun conversation that we had. So we talk about Ken's book, How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare. We dig into the method that he developed to teach his own children and that you can use to teach yours. And then also we dug a little bit deeper into the why it's important to teach Shakespeare, how to handle some of those more difficult parts, and is there any virtue to be found to hold up to our children in the Bard's plays? And I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised with everything that Ken had to share with us. It's a wonderful interview, so sit back and enjoy. Ken Ludwig is an internationally acclaimed playwright, a Shakespeare aficionado, and the author of the book, How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare. He holds degrees from Harvard, Haverford College, and Cambridge. Ken has written 22 plays and musicals and has had six shows on Broadway and seven in London's West End. His work has won numerous prestigious awards, including two Tonys and two Laurence Olivier Awards, which is England's highest theater honor. His plays have been commissioned by the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Bristol Old Vic. In How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare, Ken draws from his experience of introducing his own two children to the Bard through memorizing passages and talking about characters and storylines. He joins us on the podcast today to discuss why Shakespeare should have a place in morning time. Ken, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, we are so excited to have you. It is always wonderful to speak with somebody who is so passionate about their topic, and you really are. I really am. I'm thrilled to be here partly to talk to you and just partly to talk about my favorite subject in the world, which is Shakespeare, and especially kids learning Shakespeare from a young age. Well, do you remember your earliest experience with Shakespeare? What made you love him as much as you do? I do, actually. When I was a boy, I was about 10 years old, I think. My parents, oh, a few years earlier than that, had been to New York, had seen the famous production of Hamlet with Richard Burton. And when it rolled around to be my 10th birthday some years later, they got it in their heads to buy me the uh, recording of that production of Hamlet with Richard Burton. It was an LP recording. It was those old, you know, real discs. And they gave it to me for my birthday. And I started listening to it and listened and listened and listened. And little by little, I just loved it. I fell in love with, I guess, his voice, Richard Burton being one of the great Shakespearean actors of all time. And I fell in love with the material itself. And I ended up memorizing large chunks of it, all of the soliloquies and other parts of the play. I literally wore those vinyl discs down until they were useless. And I had, I actually since have bought another set, which I could get on eBay. And so I just fell in love with Shakespeare and started seeing as much as I could and reading as much as I could. So do you think that this love, this early love you developed for Shakespeare at about age 10 was kind of pivotal in your decision to go into the theater and acting? Absolutely. I remember going to the theater when I was a youngster too. My mother's family lived in New York. And when we would visit my grandparents, every year we would go see a Broadway show. One Broadway show a year was a big treat. And even when I was six years old, I remember very well going to the theater and at the time thinking, this is what I want to do. All I want to do is be in the theater for a living. And then Shakespeare got me and then I was really hooked. (laughs) Well, let's talk about your own children for a minute. What about their experiences with Shakespeare? As a parent, did you always know that you would want to introduce them to Shakespeare early? Or was there a moment when you kind of realized, hey, this is something I think I want to do. I think it's a good idea to start when they're young. Well, it took me by surprise. I never thought about teaching them Shakespeare per se. I loved it myself. They were growing up. And the older of the two kids, my daughter Olivia, reached first grade. 
and came home one day from school and said, Daddy, I know a bank where the wild thyme blows. And I was just rocked off my feet because that's a line from Midsummer Night's Dream. And I said, where did you learn that, Olivia? And she had learned it in school. Her teacher was an English woman who loved Shakespeare and decided that it was never too early to start teaching kids a little bit of Shakespeare, that they could memorize it easily. And indeed, She knew about four or five lines by the end of that week that her teacher was teaching her. And that's when a light bulb went off in my head. And I thought, you know, I love this stuff so much myself. And why don't I try to teach her some Shakespeare? She's six years old. She's got an open mind. She's not afraid of it yet, which is really a plus because kids, as they get older and adults all over the world, we'll talk about that, I hope, in a few minutes, you know, think Shakespeare is daunting there. It sounds confusing when you first hear it, but when you're a youngster, it doesn't. You just have an open mind and you lap it up the way you would a nursery rhyme. So after her teacher taught her these first few lines, I thought, oh, I'm going to try this. So my experiment was that she and I would snuggle up together, open a book is what I started to say, but I did better than that. What I did was I typed out on my computer whatever I wanted her to memorize. And I did it in very large type. She was just learning to read at the time. And in in an attractive font, I used Comic Sans, which is is easy to read and fun to read. And I think at 20 point, and I typed out, I know a bank where the wild time blows, where ox slips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses, and with eglantine. So those four lines, which are four lines from A a Midsummer Night's Dream, and it's when the the fairy king Oberon is telling Puck, his his mischievous second-in-command, where Titania, the the queen of the fairies, where she sleeps, this bank of flowers. And that, that description of flowers is so beautiful. And I typed those four lines out, Those are the ones she had learned at school, and we went over them, and she knew them pretty well. And I explained to her what certain words meant that she might not otherwise understand. And it's really, you know, you have kids, and presumably everyone who's listening to this podcast has kids and knows that, you know, when they're young, their minds are open and they're smart. They're smart. They're all smart. And if you explain to them very simply what the situation is, and then I would word by word, phrase by phrase, and line by line, teach her the lines, those first four she knew from school, and then the next. That particular group of lines is 10 lines long, and it's the first passage in my book. Mm -hmm. And it's a great one to start kids with. And she learned all 10 lines in no time at the end of that, I would say probably virtually at the end of that hour together. Maybe it was this, we, we spent one hour on Saturdays and one hour on Sundays. And it became my theory developed was that the best way for kids to learn Shakespeare was to memorize it. I think memorization has has, uh, taken a bit of a hit Mm. in modern education, and I don't think it should. I think memorizing poetry is a great way to make kids familiar with the sound and the meter of their favorite authors and and to really embed it in their heads so it becomes a part of them. And so I started teaching her passages from my favorite plays, and she really took to it. And that's, that's how I sort of fell into teaching my kids Shakespeare. And then this is the method, this very same method. And I have to tell you that we have really kind of latched on to this. I think it took my kids like less than two weeks to memorize that first passage. And then Great. we were doing like a poetry tea party with our friends. And that was the passage my son chose to recite at the party. Uh-huh. And oh, great. Yeah. So he, I mean, they really, you're right. Their minds are so open and receptive. And never once do they look at you and go, Mom, I can't do this. They just do it. Um, they do. Exactly. They just do it. And they love it. And they love it. It's fun. They feel a sense of accomplishment. They can see that their parents are proud of them. And often the early ones I chose are rhyming couplets. So it's easier because, you know, you're always moving towards the rhyme. I know a bank where the wild time blows, where ox 
slips to the nodding violet grows. So that's kind of like a nursery rhyme. Yeah, it really is. And that just that the rhythm of the words. And then we've taken this kind of phrasing method that you've used. You know, you've broken down all of these Shakespearean lines and there are printables available on your website Mm -hmm. where you can, you've broken them down into the phrases. And we actually have started using those for other pieces of memory work that we want to memorize as well. Breaking down these other poems into kind of these natural phrases within the poetry. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's, but tell us about your book. So this is what you have done. You have taken this method that you used for all of these years to teach your children and you've turned it into a method that now I, as a parent who might have this fear of Shakespeare, can use myself easily with my children. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I've done. And the book has it is twofold, I think, in that way, the way you describe it, which is it is, first of all, the message of the book is very simple and clear, which is don't be afraid of Shakespeare. The underground trick of the book is that it's actually as much for adults as it is for children, because so many of us and my friends who are in theater, which is most of my friends, you know, look on Shakespeare as something a little frightening. And the notion of the book is that it, it, it needn't be. It is a foreign language. Don't fool yourself. You There's no reason to think you would hear Shakespeare and be able to understand it and speak it right away. Treat it a little bit like a foreign language. Imagine if you heard a play in Italian and you didn't speak Italian. Well, you wouldn't know what they meant in those first five minutes. But if you started to learn Italian and learn a word at a time and a phrase at a time and memorize the bit, it would start to become clear. Well, Shakespeare isn't nearly as hard as a real foreign language. It's mostly accessible. 80% of it's accessible right away. But because it was written 450 years ago and because the words have changed over that time, some words we don't use anymore, some had slightly different meanings, it can seem a little confusing. So the message one of the book is don't be afraid embrace it, open your mind. Shakespeare is not only fun to do, it's not only great to do with the kids, but the fact of the matter is Shakespeare is the bedrock of Western civilization in the English language. It is absolutely what you need to know if you're going to be an educated person in our society who uses it to open the gates of all the rest of literature, because all of literature since Shakespeare is somehow based on Shakespeare, Jane Austen and Charles Dickens and Charlotte Bronte and Henry Fielding, right up to modern authors, you know, Ian McEwan and all the good novelists and prose writers of today know their Shakespeare and base things on Shakespeare-based stories and their phrasing and You need to know Shakespeare if you're going to be a really intelligent person in our society and open those gates to literature. That's sort of message one. That's the message of the book. Open your mind to Shakespeare. It's easy if you take your time and follow the method. So the second part of the book is this kind of method. And the method grew out of teaching my daughter. I had no idea in the world that I'd ever read a book about it. I had uh, no idea in the world that I was really evolving any uh, sort of method or anything new. But in trying to impart my absolute love of this language and love for these stories, so much a part of my own uh, being and wanting to share it with my children, what it evolved to was pretty simple, which was, ah, wait a second, I'll break it down into short passages. Start with the ones that are most accessible to children, usually the ones from the comedies, and have them memorize these short passages. And by memorizing them, these become part of their body language. It just becomes part of them. So when my daughter went off to college, she was able to put on her, we don't do it for applications, but she was able to take to college with her about a thousand lines of Shakespeare that she could just rattle off. Admittedly, I'm really enthusiastic about it. (laughs) So we continued to do Saturdays and Sundays from age six right through 16 or 17. I mean, yeah, it became harder as she was on the tennis team and 
doing this and that and the other. And we'd have to really say, okay, this is Shakespeare time. And did we miss a couple times when she got as old as, you know, 14, 15, 16, now and then, but not too many because we loved doing it. It was a special time together. And she loved it. She just loved learning the stories and, and saying the words. And she knew it made her special. So she literally, to this day, can rattle off hundreds and hundreds of lines of Shakespeare. You know, and that, I think this is one of the wonderful things about the book and the method that you've kind of put forth here is that it didn't grow out of this desire that you had to like make your kid the smartest or turn it into some kind of parlor trick or something like that. It grew out of a desire that you had to share your love for something with your children. And I think that's what makes it kind of a wonderful, approachable method that parents can use. Oh, well, thank you. That is absolutely true. And I, I don't think if I had wanted to make it a, uh, I like the way you put that, it's sort of like a parlor trick or a way to smarten them up. I don't think I'd have succeeded because first of all, I don't think I could have informed myself about a subject that I, I didn't love. And I don't think I could have imparted it to my children the same way. This was just to share something I love. And let me say that in order to you know, most parents who will read this book will not already have the background I had in Shakespeare. I taught it to myself, but it was just my quirky own particular interest in love because I'm a playwright and I love language and stuff. But it's easy to do. And the trick is to stay ahead of the kids just a couple pages, not even a whole chapter. If you're a parent, you go, okay, listen, I don't particularly know my Shakespeare too well. Let's, let's start with this first chapter. Ken tells me that I'm going to teach them these first, these first two lines of this passage by Oberon, the king of the fairies. If you spend time with the first two pages or three pages of the book and learn them yourself, you're ready to start with the kids. Right. Because you're, you're ahead of them. And you do, you kind of lay it out there for us and kind of explain a lot of the little nuances of the passage that we're learning and what the different words mean and why they're kind of fun or why they're important and give us that background knowledge that we need for those of us who might not be quite as knowledgeable about it there. So, Yes, thank you for saying that. And that's exactly the idea. And the stories, you know, having it tied to the stories is so important. The first of the plays that I focus on is A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is about the fairy land and lovers who escape into a magic woods and it's very accessible. And the second one is Twelfth Night, my own personal favorite among the comedies, along with Much Ado About Nothing. And I just opened the book. I have it here next to me because I knew we'd be chatting. And so I just grabbed a copy off my shelf. And I just opened it randomly. And I'm on chapter 14 on page 83, if you have it handy. And it is the beginning of the discussion of passage seven, the nature of Shakespearean comedy. So I lay out the story of Twelfth Night. And the story opens with a young woman uh, in this, this is the second scene who is washed on shore in a country she's never been to. She thinks her twin brother, who was on the voyage with her, has drowned. Her name is Viola. Her brother's name is Sebastian. But in the opening of this gorgeous opening of this scene, it's very, very simple. And why it how it match, somehow magically reels us into this woman is almost beyond description. It's hard to describe. In the previous scene, we have heard a man who she's going to fall in love with later named Orsino use really big highfalutin language because he thinks he's in love with someone. And he says, if music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it that surfeiting the appetite may sicken and so die. So he's kind of full of himself and he's full of beautiful purple language. And in the very next scene, which is you know, just like 20 lines later, all that happens is this lovely, open young woman named Viola gets washed on shore. And her opening line is, what country, friends, is this? And the captain says, this is Illyria, lady. And she says, what should I do in Illyria? My brother. He is in Elysium. Perchance he is not drowned. What think you, sailor? And the captain says, it is perchance that you yourself were saved. Well, that's one of the passages I suggest 
that kids learn is a little dialogue between these two people. And it's just so simple and it's self-explanatory. But somehow in his absolute genius, Shakespeare manages to catch her simple open heart, her love for her brother, because this whole play is about the love of a brother and a sister. And they look for each other throughout the whole play. And so in those four simple lines, we've really captured the essence of the whole play. So it gives us a basis to tell the story of the play to our kids. And as I say, my kids just love this stuff. I think some of the genius in Shakespeare is how he kind of manipulates the language to, in the way people speak within the plays, that tells you about their character. It's not just what they say, but also the words that they use and how they say it and the kind of language they use. You know, and I'm thinking of like even characters that were slightly confusing, like say Caliban and the Tempest, where sometimes mm-hmm. he's in iambic pentameter and sometimes he's in prose and you're trying to figure him out. I, I, well, that's very right. Yeah. yeah. So it, that's very, very astute of you to say that that's exactly right. Shakespeare tells us everything in his language. And once you hear somebody speak, you kind of get a really good sense if they're good hearted, if they're evil, mm-hmm. if they're plotting, what they're up to. And that's really smart of you. That's exactly right. Well, let's talk about some of these, some of the challenges that some families might have with Shakespeare that kind of go beyond the fear. So if I'm kind of over my fear of okay. Shakespeare a little bit and I'm ready to maybe work on some of this with my kids. Now, you've told me that one of the main reasons that I should study Shakespeare with my children is because he is kind of the bedrock or the foundation of all Western literature since his time. So do you have any other reasons why we should kind of push past some of these fears and difficulties and study Shakespeare? Well, I do. I do. I think certainly one of them is as simple as increasing our vocabulary, learning how to read literature, literature of any age that predates us in a significant way, let's say Dickens or Austen, is not readily, it's not as easily readable as Harry Potter. And because it's because it was written 100 or 200 years ago. So reading Shakespeare teaches us how to, you know, how to read literature. And to answer that, well, let me finish that thought. It does a few things. It does that. It also teaches us really good moral values, as does Dickens keep going back to Dickens and Austin and Bronte, but, you know, as do most major authors, they've thought very hard about life and they've thought through problems that we all encounter and how we face them. And that's what literature does for us. And it makes us think harder about, you know, doing unto others as you would have done to yourself. It makes you think about, you know, compassion and heart and good and evil and all kinds of love, the love you have for your wife and husband, as well as the love you have for your children and for your siblings. And because Shakespeare is filled with stories about all these interfamily relationships. So it makes you think harder and therefore you get smarter and smarter. It just makes you smarter because you're thinking about things that are important. To go back to the earlier part of your question, in addition to being exposed to it and fighting past your worry about your fear of it, what else can you do to help fight past that? And that's something that I talk about early in the book, which is it is part of the technique I haven't talked about yet is, is making sure that you and then your kids understand every word of each line and therefore every phrase, and therefore what it really says. Because once you really understand what it says, you can't really memorize it till then. I'm sort of paging through the books here, through the book right now to see if I find a good passage to use as an example. Here's four lines from Twelfth Night, when Viola, she's in disguise as a young boy named Cesario, is talking to a woman, and her master, Viola's master wants this woman to fall in love with him, the object of affection is Olivia, my daughter's name, by the way. And Cesario says, if I did love you in my master's flame with such a suffering, such a deadly life, in your denial, I would find no sense. I would not understand it. So until you can't memorize those four lines till you really understand what each of those 
words means. If is if you turned to someone and you said, I don't understand why you don't love my my son. If I did love you in my master's flame, what does flame mean? Flame is obviously Shakespeare taking the word and using it in an original way that I don't think it's ever been used since. If I did love you in my master's way of loving, if I did love you in the same way my master does, in my master's flame, well, and it suggests the word, you know, flame is, you know, fire, and someone has fire in their heart. And in this case, it's the love of a man and a woman, not sibling love. So it's, if I did love you with a flame of passion the way he did, with such a suffering, such a deadly life, in your denial, I would find no sense. Well, maybe if you're talking with a younger kid, you know, they don't, what does denial mean? Denial means you know, saying no to something. So until you understand all the words in those four lines, you don't, you're not going to understand the passage, and you can't really memorize it with any integrity. So an important step in this is going slowly enough that you understand every word of the passage. Okay, yes, that makes perfect sense that, you know, you would need to have a, a good understanding of what's being said in order to kind of embody it and make it your own. Right. Which kind of leads me to my next question. There are some parts of Shakespeare I'm not so sure I want my kids to understand at eight or nine years old. So what should I do as I'm introducing my kids about some of the violence and maybe innuendos in Shakespeare? How do you handle that? I think I handled it. Well, two answers. One is this book particularly is gauged so that these passages, I don't start the book with Macbeth. I don't start it with King Lear. In fact, I don't think I quite get to King Lear in the book as much as I'd have liked to. I couldn't cover everything. So the passages in this book are gauged so that if you use the ones that I've chosen, the kids aren't being exposed to anything before they should be because I chose them carefully for my kids. I didn't want my kids ex- exposed to that either when they're you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. I don't really want them thinking about, you know, there's a famous, a long poem, Shakespeare wrote the rape of Lucrece. I don't want them thinking about rape or horrible things like that when at age nine and 10 years old. And then in terms of after that, you know, they're going to grow and understand what they're going to understand the way they do with everything when God knows they're exposed to so much with television and movies. I remember taking my, (laughs) I remember my mother and dad taking me to a movie when I was a kid and, and later thinking them looking to each other and going, oh my God, what did we do? And I didn't know what they were talking about because I didn't understand the thing they were worried about me seeing. I just <laughs> didn't get it. It was going over my head. And I think kids will absorb those things when they're ready. And I don't think there's anything in Shakespeare we need worry about. I mean, Shakespeare is filled with all the things that life is filled with life and death. I mean, in Romeo and Juliet, which is one of the earlier plays that kids get exposed to. When they get exposed to it, which normally at school and things, when they're in maybe seventh, eighth grade, when you're in eighth grade, you're 14 years old, right? When you're 14, 15, you're going to learn about, you know, the sad realities of death. Because in Romeo and Juliet, you know, the tragedy does revolve around the deaths of Romeo and Juliet. And when they're ready to take that in, I, I wouldn't be using that with my daughter when she's seven, eight, nine, just because it's they're not going to understand it in any profound way. But by the time they're 14, 15, and 16, they may have lost a grand, they'll probably almost certainly have lost a grandparent and be seeing things that makes that reality have meaning to them. When right. they're little, that doesn't have any meaning to them. So we're and just, then, then it's appropriate. And so we're just kind of drip out the full, I guess, content of Shakespeare over the times that it's appropriate for them to finally come to realize those later plays that are maybe a little deeper and darker and have more things in there that are better suited to older children. Absolutely. I think approaching Shakespeare, choosing the right material to make it age appropriate for the kids is very important. Yeah. And, you know, we took, I took my daughter Oh, goodness, it was almost two years ago now. So she would have been maybe eight and a half or nine years old to a local university production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. And, you know, there were a few moments where it got a little racy there, you know, 
mm-hmm. Titania and Bottom had kind of gone off together and there was a little bower set up and the fairies were kind of, you know, doing their silly thing around there. And, you know, she completely went over her head. So You're right. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly it. You go, well, I guess there's oh sure, why wouldn't they be sleeping together, Mom? We all sleep. We all right. take a good nap together. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. So and when I, they're ready, they'll understand it. Right. And I was I was not going to offer explanation. She was just enjoying the play for what she saw. So <laughs> Right. That's great. Well, you know, at Your Morning Basket, our tagline is truth, goodness, and beauty for your homeschool day. So could you help me out in finding some truth, goodness, and beauty in Shakespeare? Do you have some examples of virtuous characters or eternal truths? And you've already touched on these with kind of like the importance of family and the relationships there and all of his examples of love and things of that nature. But do you have some virtuous characters that you could share with us from Shakespeare? who we could kind of there hold up as examples. Are, absolutely. Absolutely. There are dozens of virtuous characters in Shakespeare who we, we love for the goodness of their hearts and we love for the good deeds they do at the same time. All the comedies I've been talking about are filled with those kinds of characters. Not all the characters are that way. Oberon and Titania are rather a little spiteful with each other, the king and queen of the fairies. But the four lovers Hermia and Helena and Lysander and Demetrius are all good kids. They're all good teenagers who mean well and don't want to offend. She doesn't want to, poor Hermia doesn't want to offend her father, but, you know, she can't live under certain rules at the age she is. Beatrice and Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing. They're an older couple who are in love and they're funny and they're always funny. But they they have such good hearts. Beatrice says at one point, a star danced, and then I was born. It's her way of expressing the fact that she's good-humored, that she always has a twinkle in her eye and and always sort of likes a good laugh. Those are my favorite characters that way. Imogen in a Cymbeline is a, a, a woman of pure heart and love and saves her country as well as it discovers in the course of the play two long lost brothers who she comes to love. But the comedies and romances are filled with people we want to emulate. Yeah, the comedies tend to, to fall into characters who are good natured, and then the pompous, silly characters who are the ones who are good natured like to show up for their pomposity. So in Twelfth Night, my favorite, favorite character in all of Shakespeare, Viola who I was just talking about a moment ago, who gets washed up on shore, couldn't be a purer heart, couldn't be more virtuous. And in the course of her life in Illyria, where, where the country that she comes to live in, we meet Malvolio, who is not a villain. He is also of good heart, but he's teased because he is a servant and he's in love with the mistress who he serves. He's like the butler and she's a She's the woman he works for, and he's secretly in love with this wonderful woman named Olivia. So if I was, gee, I could make a list that was dozens of pages long about about virtuous characters in, in Shakespeare. But start with Viola, start with Beatrice and Benedict and Imogen. Well, and there are certainly some eternal truths and lessons we can learn from the not-so-virtuous characters and the tragedies as well, I'm sure. Oh, there's a wonderful speech, absolutely. In Hamlet, Polonius, the old sort of overly talkative sort of chief of staff to the king, is not himself a very good man, but he gives a famous series set of advice to his son who is going to France that ends with, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. And his famous advice to his son as he goes off into life, even though he's a bit of a pompous fool, it's a moment that Shakespeare must have decided that, well, I know he's he's a bit pompous, and I know he's uh, he's overbearing, and he causes trouble in the play, but I have a moment here in the play where I have a father giving advice to his child as his child goes off into life, and I'm going to give him the best 12 lines I ever wrote. And uh, that's, a, uh, that's one of the great passages in all of Shakespeare. It's a lovely example. 
Well, one of the things that I believe about Shakespeare personally is that you shouldn't just sit there with your book and read it silently to yourself. That you know, reading it aloud yourself, memorizing passages are all, those are wonderful. But Shakespeare was really meant to be experienced, to be seen. So what are some qualities that parents should look for in a good Shakespeare production to share with their children? Which movies should we look for? Which even local productions, what kind of qualities should we look for in that to choose the right ones? Well, go by the reputation of the acting company you're going to see. You know, if you're in your local situation, some will be probably spectacularly good and sensitive and wonderful, and some might miss the mark. And that'll depend on the quality of the director and the actors and how they interpret the text, whether they're true to it or whether they go off on a tangent. Some of these, you know, local productions will go, oh, I have a new way of looking at Taming the Shrew. I'm going to set it in the Wild West. I've seen it, two or three productions of Taming of the Shrew set in the Wild West. So, and that doesn't mean by nature that it can't be a good production and have a lot of heart and be interesting. But, you know, if somebody's going to imprint something a little off the mark on Shakespeare, you usually go in at least with a question mark in your mind. It's more likely you're going to get a good production from a company that is tried and true and over, over time has, has served you well. When you get into the larger sphere, you know that if it's got, uh, I'm on the board of governors of the Folger Shakespeare Library here in Washington, D.C. We do three productions a year. We've recorded all the productions. So the Folger recordings are terrific. They're tried and true, and they're wonderful. The Royal Shakespeare Company, or the RSC in Stratford, England, has done great productions of, of Shakespeare for 50, 60 years now. They're just a mecca. They were the greatest place for Shakespeare in the world for a period of about 25 years. Another equally great place now is the Globe Theater in London. And these are not inaccessible because the RSC puts a lot of its things out on DVD. And the Globe now puts all of its productions out on DVD. Started this about three or four years ago. They had the best production ever of, of Much Ado, About Nothing, a terrific one of The Tempest I just saw. Virtually all, all of the plays are available from the Globe and the RSC. Great audio productions are a company called Archangel has done all of the plays and has uh, they're easy to get on DVD or st- to stream them. And you're absolutely right. I mean, Shakespeare was meant to be heard and spoken and seen, and that's the best way to get to expose to him. And let me add that, you know, if somebody has a Shakespeare comic book, great, more power to them. Any way to get exposed to it. You know, there's a lot of graphic novels these days, I mean, you know, novels that are with drawings and less words, more drawings. And that's fine, too, because, a lot, you know, most of these people who spend that much time doing something are doing it out of love. And if you get the essence of the play that way for the first time or retellings of the stories for children, that's great. That's great. Start there. All excellent advice. Well, Ken, thank you so much for joining us here today to talk about your book and about your passion for Shakespeare and share this with us. And where can people find the book and find you online? Well, thank you for asking. The book is titled How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare. It's certainly on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I'm glad to say it was a bestseller on Amazon. About four weeks ago, it hit one of their bestseller lists, and I was thrilled, just thrilled with that. <laughs> I, took a, I took a picture of it on my phone. Oh, I bet. Uh, uh, it was great. So it's, it's easily available in all bookstores. I go over. I, I was just in England last, oh, two, three weeks, I guess it's now two, three weeks ago, and I went into the Globe Bookstore, and there it was, and I went to the National Theater Bookstore, and there it was. So I was thrilled with that. So you can also go to how to teach your children shakespeare.com <laughs> it's a lot to type out and there's the website for the book it was published by random house and it still is it's now in paperback so they set up that website for it the best place probably to go is is my website my own website which is just simply kenludwig.com and uh, there's links there to to purchase the book through amazon i think and barnes and noble and also, I encourage people, if you can, to, to tweet me. I've got a Twitter feed uh, that is simply Ken under, at Ken underscore Ludwig. And I 
often post pictures of productions of my plays. A lot of my plays, as you can imagine, are based on Shakespeare. One I wrote called Shakespeare in Hollywood that I was commissioned to do for the Royal Shakespeare Company is about the production of Midsummer Night's Dream in Hollywood. There was a very famous production in the 1930s with Mickey Rooney and Olivia de Havilland. Mm -hmm. And what I I posit in the play is that that we're backstage during the filming of it. And Oberon and Puck turn up, the real Oberon and Puck. And that play, that one's based on Midsummer, and I've done other plays. uh, Several of my plays are based on Shakespearean themes. So uh, my website's a good place to find those. Well, we will post links to all of those websites and also your Twitter feed, which sounds like a lot of fun, in the show notes for this episode so people can find that really easily. So, Oh, well, great. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. It's been a pleasure. I, I really appreciate the time. And, and I can tell you share my enthusiasm for this. So that's great. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of fun. And there you have it, episode 21 of the Your Morning Basket podcast. Now, for today's basket bonus, what we have for you is kind of a little cheat sheet to help you really seek out the good themes and the virtuous themes in Shakespeare's plays. So what we have done is we have taken many of the plays that Ken talked about and has passages from in his book, How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare, And we've kind of pulled out some of the virtuous themes for you. I actually have a dream team of helpers here. My podcast manager, Mary Ryder, and her husband, Dr. Jeffrey Ryder, have worked together on this project. It's so nice to have wonderful help like this. They have helped me pull together this list for you of some of the virtues in these Shakespeare plays so we can talk about these themes with our children as we're memorizing these passages and hiding these words in our heart. So I hope you're going to find that really useful today. You can find that over in the show notes for this episode. You will find that at edsnapshots.com forward slash YMB21. Also there, you'll find links to a number of the resources that Ken and I talked about for making Shakespeare more accessible to your children, as well as his own website where you can find out more information. Also there, if you are so inclined, there is a place that walks you through how to leave a rating or review for the Your Morning Basket podcast in iTunes. So if you would like to do that, we show you exactly how. And to all of you who have already left a rating or review for the Your Morning Basket podcast, we just want to say thank you so much for doing that. The ratings and reviews you leave in iTunes help us get word out about the podcast to new listeners. And so we really appreciate it. We'll be back again in another couple of weeks with another great Morning Basket interview. And until then, we hope you keep seeking truth, goodness, and beauty in your homeschool day. (laughs) 